So today we're going to talk about a, a few things. We're going to start um, with some very big macro debates about what, what's happening and potentially one of the bigger pivots we've seen since the global financial crisis. And it all you know, really starts there, um, all the way into some of the micro events that's happening and sometime some of the, of the short um, trading frame. But I think it's really, really important because I think some of the bigger shifts in, um, in macro are taking place right now. And it's really important to notice. OK, cool. Well, Itai, the, uh, the screen is yours. Everybody's on uh, pins and needles waiting for this. Let's, uh, let's hop into the content. Sure. So Equity University, May 2nd, 2022, as Jeremy mentioned so beautifully, um, Equi, uh, making elite investing accessible. We are uh, a one-stop shop digital family office uh, for your investing needs in good and in more troubling times like what we've seen now. So quick market update. Let's talk about April for, for a second. April was not a good month by any means um, for the financial markets, which historically April actually tends to be pretty positive, actually has fairly positive historical seasonality more than other months. And the 13% drop in the NASDAQ was actually the largest drop since Sleeman. Um, S&P is now the worst month since the March 2020 uh, COVID outbreak. So very, very substantial uh, negative month. What's interesting when you break down the S&P sector decline, uh, tech is actually not the biggest loser. Uh, it is consumer discretionary, had the uh, largest impact. Obviously, Amazon um, Friday wasn't very helpful with that. But what's interesting is consumer staples were almost untouched, while consumer discretionary had the uh, largest uh, drop contribution to drop in the sector. Itai, what does it mean if of all the largest losers here that consumer discretionary is the one that's, that's the biggest? What does that tell you? I think it's recession fears. You're seeing basically uh, uh, discretionary income being potentially, potentially hit. Just some more stats on the magnitude of the drawdown. If you look at the first four months uh, of the year, this is actually now the worst start to a year since the start of World War II, um, where the market was down about a little bit more than that in 1939. So pretty, pretty substantial uh, losses for that four months. Let's go into the NASDAQ under the surface just to get a little better indication of the amount of pain out there. 45% of stocks are down over 50%, 22% down over 75%, and 5% down over 90%. Um, and the only two comparison we can find for that are October 2000 through 2002, which is really the pop of the, of the dot-com bubble, and then the global financial crisis, 08 through 09. So a lot of pain out there for the average stock. The bond market offered very little relief um, for the month. Uh, minus 11% is the largest drawdown in U.S. bond markets since 1980. Um, and reminding you that back in 1980, the treasury yield was 12.6%, not 2.9%. So when treasuries are so compressed, it doesn't take too much of an increase to create a fairly large drawdown uh, just because it comes from a very, very low level. And a, a few thoughts over the concentration risk. You know, we've all been uh, warning about the FANG problem where the S&P 500 was concentrated in just a few very, very large stocks. So the problem is when you get a big drawdown in one of those stocks, it has a big impact on the index, like what we've seen this past Friday. Um, Amazon is now, for example, in the largest drawdown since 09, it's down roughly 33%. So you can see the Amazon drawdown here in 2000. That was pretty, pretty insane. It was over 90%, obviously, and it, it took it years and years and years to recover. And 33% um, is pretty substantial drawdown for Amazon. Itai, could you rewind just a little bit to talk a little bit more about why bonds are drawing down so much and maybe talk about the rising interest rates? And for anybody that's sitting around in real estate or doing things related to, to, to lending, why that impacts them so much? Yeah, so we explained this in the last call as well. So you have to re remember that the bond market, um, are bond, bond prices are inversely correlated to bond yields. 
So what, ha what ends up happening is that interest rates rise, um, the price of the bond goes down to offset the larger increase. So imagine you know, new, new issuance come in at par, the old issuance have to have a certain discount to par in order to make the same payment as those new issuance are gonna be. So rising interest rates can lead to pretty big losses on longer duration bonds. Less so on shorter duration bonds, but definitely on the longer end. Got it. And then the 10 year is basically the, the proxy for the entire lending market. When we take out loans to buy real estate, it's always the benchmark on that 10 year. Correct. Or, or, or the 30 years, but, but it's definitely based on um, the, longer, the longer duration versus the federal fund rates. The easiest way to think about it is the short end, the short end of the curve is dictated by the Fed, where the long end of the curve is the market. And some and some central bank manipulation, but we'll we'll talk about that. Perfect. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the very high level business theory because I think it really comes to play with what's going on right now um, when it comes to the Austrian versus Keynesian school and how you look at this bigger macro environment. I think it's really important to understand what's actually happening here. So according to the Austrian business theory, um, the boom really turns to bust when interest rates increase when interest rates rise and that impacts everything. And why is that? So there's really two schools of thought when it comes to, um, when it comes to the economy here where the Keynesian school of thought basically means that during a time of contraction, you need to spend more and expend the government deficit, fiscal and monetary policy and create more liquidity in order to uh, turn the cycle over. Wherein the Austrian school of thought that by the way, hasn't been um, discussed for many, many years uh, the idea here is to let the market correct itself and have minimal government intervention and eventually market pricing will figure it out. And the main cause for the bust is really artificial credit expansion and it's not, um, and it's not like the natural cycle of the market. So why is this important? Why are we talking about the great experiment? Because after 2008, um, the global central banks basically decided that they're taking an extremely Keynesian approach when it comes to monetary and fiscal policies and has been the case since and even went into much more extreme since COVID. And the main idea behind it is when you're looking at this Austrian school of thought, they're assuming that because central banks hold the interest rates low, and then what happens is, is the banks just start extending all these loans at very low interest rates. Basically, money is almost free. When money is free, businesses tend to overinvest because capital is so easily accessible, it's over, almost unnaturally easily accessible. So they're starting to invest in order to make a return. Um, so what you're seeing is, let's say, cap rates go lower and it's more difficult to make a return and everybody chases, um, everybody chases the same resources. Then you create misallocation of resources, you do mail investments, you get into an unsustainable boom, and then you get into a bust and when you get into the bus, the, the central bank prints money and lowers interest rates again. So this will continue indefinitely until inflation becomes a problem. When inflation becomes a problem, the central bank may be in a situation that they cannot sustain another boom because they can't lower interest rates again. And that's kind of how that cycle um, comes to an end. Uh, yeah, Jeremy? It's a super good question. When, when, um, when the government issues treasuries, how do they, how is the yield established? Um, it's basically the, the prevailing yield um, in the market at the time. There's usually an auction. There's an auction for those treasuries. Um, and then the auction is basically set by what, whatever the existing treasury yield are very close to. So if the Fed comes in and buys a whole bunch, they can basically create the yield that they want. Correct. That 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 that's been going on. So, for example, in the QE period, the Treasury Department would issue bonds, and then the Fed would buy those bonds with freshly created money, um, and that could suppress yields. Yes. Or what we're seeing in other places, we'll talk about that yield curve controls and all those other things, where central banks try to artificially reduce the yield. Okay. Got it. So it is. It is subject to the market. It just depends on who is the, in the market buying that will all, and how much they're buying that will ultimately impact what those yields are. Yes, there's a lot of participants in that, but you want to avoid, I mean, there are some places where the bond market became almost like a zombie nation like Japan because um, 
you know, the, the Bank of Japan is the only, the is, only the buyer. Is, is the only buyer, is the only buyer there. If they're not um, buying, it's, it's closed up for business, my man. And we'll talk about that in a second. But one of the, one of the things I've been hearing about is, you know, the Austrian school of thought is considering what we're seeing right now is sort of the end game of the, um, of the experiment, because once inflation is really high and central banks can't reignite this cycle, that's when things become very problematic. But it's important to realize that the government never actually followed what Keynes was, what Keynesian economic is. The classic idea of Keynesian economic is actually when you're going through a boom, the government should run a surplus to save up for the bust and then use that capital when the bust actually happens. So it's important to realize that that never happened. Um, what we've seen is that during the boom times, like here, so recessions are in shaded areas, um, and above the zero line is a surplus and below is a deficit. And this is obviously um, where they adjusted. So we're seeing them consistently running a deficit, a small deficit, right? Then the global financial crisis happens, they run an even bigger deficit, but then they keep running that big deficit even during the recovery. There's never any surplus or saving for another bus. And then COVID happens and the deficit becomes extreme. And why is that? So I think we ran, we ran a very short um, stint, not just with Keynesian economics, but with the idea of modern monetary policy. Um, we covered that extensively in one of our calls in 2020 when we analyzed this and, and suggested that that may be, may be happening. And MMT is a really interesting idea. It's the idea that governments can create as much deficit as they want and it will never create a problem because as long as a nation state can create its own currency, it can never default. So having too little of a deficit is actually a problem because it hinders economic growth. So the idea here is that the government took the Keynesian idea, but they never implemented it because they, they spend money during the boom, but then they spend more money during the bust. Um, so you're always in a consistent deficit. It's actually more like light MMT. And then post COVID, we went into fully blown MMT. So the, you know, MMT is interesting because it says government debt doesn't really matter um, because as long as the government can create its own currency, it can buy its debt. So it's never going to matter. You can have as much debt as you want. Uh, and inflation doesn't really matter because inflation only occurs when there's full employment. But then if there is full employment, all you have to do, if you want, you can reduce government spending and raise taxes. So as long as you do that correctly, you're never going to face inflation either. So clearly that didn't work too well, as we all know. Um, and how do we know that, the, that they basically adopted MMT during COVID? Well, all you have to do is figure out what happened to the M2 money supply. Between 2020 and currently, uh, the money supply went from about 15 trillion or so uh, just to around 22 trillion or so. So if you do a quick math, that is a monstrous increase in the current existing amount of dollars in circulation. And at the same time, the federal deficit ballooned massively as the government just spent a ton of money while the economy was shut down. So let's just, let's just quantify that. Uh, that increase was actually a 46% increase in all the dollars in circulation period. It was just like somebody went to that printer and it was just like, enter, 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 enter with a whole bunch of zeros attached to it. Right. And, 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 and a lot of people will say, well, what was the alternative? The economy was completely shut down. You know, we would could have faced another Great Depression. Um, and that was, you know, that was the way to keep the flow. Whatever, whatever it may be, um, it created a lot more dollars uh, in circulation and created a lot of market dislocations. Um, this is likely the root cause for inflation. You know, we, we obviously have supply chain issues due to COVID. We obviously had, you know, Russia way, way later coming in and uh, disrupting commodity prices, especially agricultural commodities and things like that, and it's worth Ukraine. But the core reason for this existed a lot longer, and I think that was the response to the COVID pandemic, which is why we're now facing the highest inflation since 1981, um, and it's been fairly uh, relentless. What's really interesting, though, is that in the 1980s, the government used to calculate inflation very differently than the way it calculates inflation now. Uh, there's this interesting website that I like, Shadow Stats, and that they can actually give you an alternate CPI based on the way the government actually calculated it in 1980. 
not the way of calculating it correctly. So if you calculated inflation currently the way it calculates in 1980, CPI is closer to 16%, not 8.5%. Can, can you give an example of one of the major omissions or maybe category, categorical changes of why CPI might only show it 8% versus truly where it likely sits, which is closer to 15 or above? There's, there's all these types of adjustments and things they do in the data, but one of them, for example, give me an, an idea is the, the idea of substitution. So let's say you have a basket of certain things as measured for inflation, and let's say salmon is one of them. So let's say the price of salmon goes up 30% and the price of tuna goes up 3%, right? So they're going to assume any reasonable person is going to swap salmon for tuna. So then they take salmon out and they put tuna in, and then what does that do to the inflation number? It didn't mean that salmon didn't go up, but they assume you, okay, so you won't buy it anymore. So those are the kind of things that are continuously being adjusted into these numbers. Thank you. Sure. Um, so it's also important to realize that based on the old school type of models the Fed used to use, so the Taylor rule, um, very classic one. The Taylor rule is really where should the Fed funds rate be when we count two things, which is employment and inflation, right? Those are the two Fed mandates, uh, full employment as well as price stability, which is inflation. So according to the Taylor rule right now, the Fed fund rate should be at 10% adjust because we're at full employment. Unemployment is exceptionally low and um, we have a relatively high level of inflation. And you can see the Fed fund rate used to track uh, the Taylor rule fairly well until the global financial crisis in 08. And then they really let inflation run um, even, even that time because unemployment was improving. Um, and now it's really the largest deviation you've seen. So this is something we brought up in the December call. Um, I felt at the time it was really important because there was a big pivot from what the Fed used to do, which is basically throw dollars around like uh, it's going out of style. And um, during the, the testimony that, that Jay Powell did in late November, he said that the word inflation, the word transitory should be omitted when it comes to inflation, uh, because inflation is likely more permanent than they previously believed. And he hinted that should retire that word. Um, coincidentally, that was not far away from when markets topped because the Fed really decided to change their stance. I think that pivot is one of the most important ones that happened um, in the really recent history of the Fed. The Fed is slamming the brakes exceptionally hard. There's going to be uh, a Fed meeting on May 4th, two days from now. Um, you can use the Fed funds futures to estimate what the interest rate is going to look like after that Fed meeting. So that's a market, um, market estimate of the Fed. And it's now pricing in 75 to 100 basis points on May 4th at a 98.5% chance. And Itai, real quick, I post this every single time we do one of these calls. I hope that one day some of the people actually bookmark it. I'm gonna post it in everyone, so please check. This is where we go to collect this data. If you wanna start seeing the world the way that Itai sees it, just, just bookmark this and you can take a look at all the probabilities of each of the future. Uh, meetings that are being had by the Fed, note that they're always in flux, they're in transit, it could, it could change based on the, uh, on the market conditions, but this is a great way to get educated about the direction of short-term interest rates and the federal funds rate out in the market. Continue the show. Yeah, absolutely. So why is this, e why is this so important? Yeah, they're raising interest rate, that's great, but they're actually doing a two-for-one rate hike. So they're not raising interest rates by 0.25%, they're actually raising interest rates by half of a percent in one serving. Um, and the last time they did that, I believe is 2000. So the Fed is being as aggressive as they could be, but it's not only this near term meeting. If you go to December of this year, which is really not that far away, we're currently sitting at just 25 basis points. So take that in mind. The market is projecting we're gonna end the year anyway between 2.75 and 3.25 on the federal fund rate. That is one of the most aggressive Fed rate increases in history. So the Fed has truly done a full 180 from printing money out of control and keeping rates at zero to one of the most aggressive interest rate increases and soon will cover quantitative tightening. And Itai, do you think you could just quickly touch on, the, um, on how the short-term interest rates and the federal funds 
rates impact both the 10 year and the 30 year treasury and maybe just some of the interplay between the two of those? Yeah, so that's actually an interesting thing because the Fed fund rate is controlled fully by, by the Fed, which is, you know, the FOMC meeting is a small body, but the 10 and 30 year treasuries are market, are market floating. The Fed has some impact on that because of the balance sheet where they buy or sell treasuries, but it's not, you know, fully controlled by, by the central bank like it is in other countries. Um, so it does have an impact, obviously, if the Fed fund rate is higher, you know, yields could be higher. But then if, if the treasury curve was normal, the longer duration bonds should have a higher yield. But if the treasury curve is inverted, it's either flat or the short end even has a higher rate to it. And, you know, we covered that on the last call talking about the um, yield curve inversion uh, and, you know, what it signals that, you know, markets may signal a recession at a certain period of time when that happens. Oh. Hey, Rob. Okay, so I just want one thing of observation. Do you think the, the Fed's raising the rates high in big oh. chunks right now? Not high, but in big chunks right now, so that then they can quickly then start lowering them slowly by little bits and then everybody's psychology then changes hey now they're lowering rates yeah that's a good question i think the the fed funds futures are pricing in a couple of cuts at uh, end of 23 so there is some merit to that but i think it really depends on what inflation does right that's the biggest wild card if inflation stays high um that's going to be a big problem for the fed because then they, they won't be able to backtrack so i think it really depends on on inflation but sure, if they raise interest rates enough, they will have more. The more they raise rates, the more QT they do, the more the more firepower they're going to have um, if and when things turn around again. Itai, real, real quick question. You know, in this Fed fund, this Fed fund rate graph that gives you the probability of uh, of, a, of a rate hike. What are uh, I guess like how do how do they know how certain that's going to be because it can change from day to day like what are the you know like how how serious should somebody take these these graphs when they see them extremely seriously that fed funds futures market is more accurate for predicting where the fed funds rate would be um than the fed dot plot itself typically and the fed telegraphs it and watches these things too so when the fed spoke a couple of times about a 50 basis point increase in May. Initially, the probability was low, but then they said, we may do it, we may do it, probability keeps going higher. And then Powell said, I think we're gonna do it, probability goes to 90 some percent. So that market just follows the Fed speakers, what they say, what they do, how they act, the Fed plots and things like that. Now, it's Thanks. interesting too, it's interesting too, because in the past, what I've noticed about this market is when equities fell or fell enough, the probability of rate increases in this market dropped, meaning that the market Fed fund future was expecting that the Fed would capitulate or stop raising rates. And this time it's not happening. Um, markets are down, but the Fed fund futures are still pricing in a lot of increases. So it's, it's really interesting. Okay, um, let's talk about one of the even more important things than, than interest rates. Interest rates, I think most people understand, it's easy. Um, let's talk about the move from QE to quantitative tightening, from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. So what the Fed was doing for many, many years, uh, really since 08, with some breaks in between, they were creating money out of thin air, but they weren't just putting it in the economy. Um, they were using it to buy treasuries um, in MBS. We'll talk about that in a sec. And that was basically giving money to the federal government. So what's happening in QT is that these treasuries mature. And as they mature, you get your principal and your interest back. But unlike a normal person that's going to take that money and be happy with it or maybe reinvest it or whatever they may do, uh, the Fed just hits the delete button and makes that money disappear from circulation, which contracts the economy. Um, there's just less money chasing less assets. So that's why QT is so substantial. And QT is expected to um, start right around now, starting in May and take the balance sheet from $9 trillion all the way to $6 trillion by 2025, based on estimations currently. And why is it so, so important? Um, if you take global equities measured by MSCI World, uh, obviously that impacts the S&P as well. That's a big part of it. Starting in 2009, 
up until currently, and you run a simple regression on that data, you would find that the, the balance sheet of the, of the central bank can explain 90% of the index price levels. So it's very, very substantial. Um, obviously, correlation is not necessarily the causation, but when something with such a high degree of correlation to risk assets starts a big decline, um, that's something that I pay uh, extra attention to. You can see in 2022, we still have some net positive because uh, the, the, the Fed is not the only central bank in town, but in 2023, it's expected to go substantially net negative. You can see that since the QE era started here in um, 09, with the exception of a very small quantitative tightening period in 2000, um, late 18 into 19, uh, we haven't had really that level of negative um, drop in the balance sheet. And in fact, going in now, um, this is going to be the most unprecedented pace of decline in, uh, in the balance sheet up until now. We've had a few more minor ones in 18, um, you know, 11, 12, and uh, 2010. All of them had many market turmoil events happening at that time. Um, all of them saw the Fed going back to QE or lowering rates again. Um, this one is a lot bigger. And with inflation running as high as it is, it's unlikely that the Fed is going to move away from this stance. So very, very important times. To understand this better, the Fed is not only holding treasuries, it, only, it also holds a lot of mortgage-backed securities. Um, and both of them are going to decline substantially in the years to come, according to projections. Um, it's really important for the real estate market as well, because if you think of an MBS, think of, let's say, a Freddie Mac loan. Um, then I know I hold a few of those. And it's collateralized by the value of real estate. And when the Fed supports the MBS market, yields can come down and it generates more liquidity in these bonds, which... Um, really supports the real estate market. So when you're seeing, let's say, 30-year mortgages rise massively over the last um, few months, it, it is definitely um, related to, to what you're seeing right now. So the need side, a few quick things. One, what I, what I interpret from reading this is, one, that they're, they're not going to be intervening in the MBS market as much, which means less liquidity in the right side for real estate, maybe more market level. But then two, isn't this a big money-making uh, corporation for the federal government as well when they're issuing a ton of this Freddie type of loan? Yeah, I mean, they're still going to issue it, right? But the, the, the difference is, is that the market buyers now have to absorb both the Fed selling a certain amount of it or, or letting it expire. Um, and it just they just have to fend for themselves. It's just natural buyers and sellers at this point, plus the, the, the added selling of the Fed. Cool. And Itai, did we, uh, and, I, and I forget, did we talk about the mechanics of how QT takes the money out of the system or would it be helpful to quickly revisit that? Yeah, we, we mentioned it briefly. Okay, cool. Thanks. No worries. Um, a few other things that have somewhat correlation to the balance sheet and have broken off lately. Uh, tech measured here by the Qs has been following the Fed balance sheet quite a bit and had some of the biggest increases in 20 and 21. Uh, after that giant balance sheet expansion. Uh, the question is, is it front running the reduction of the Fed balance sheet that's expected in the second half of 2022 and 2023? Um, another thing, what about Bitcoin, right? We've basically the reason to buy Bitcoin and the reason um, it had this massive rise in 2020, 2021, a lot of the narrative was um, the devaluation of the dollar and this aggressive devaluation of fiat currencies. But when you're actually seeing the balance sheet reduction, there's a contraction in the amount of dollars in circulation. Um, what does that mean for the price of Bitcoin? So we actually have seen Bitcoin front running a potential reduction in the Fed balance sheet as well. And Bitcoin has been exceptionally correlated recently with the NASDAQ. Um, I know futures are closed over the weekend, but if you want to get an indication of where they're going to open, all you have to do is watch Bitcoin over the weekend. That is very true. One of the things uh, that I watch for is cross asset volatility. So in this case, the move is the bond VIX. Um, and the move has really exploded higher. And one of the things that has been 
you know, worrisome, of course, is that when the Fed expanded its balance sheet and its buying bonds, uh, it had an impact on volatility. Volatility was re relatively subdued, right? You had that giant explosion in volatility and COVID, and then the Fed balance sheet expansion really calmed volatility down. But the current uncertainty in the bond market, really both ways, is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Nobody really knows. The cost of hedging has exploded. And as a result of that, we're seeing a lot of volatility. Um, and as the Fed balance sheet is going to decline, that could, in fact, continue. Also, uh, margin debt has been pretty correlated with the Fed balance sheet too. And margin debt is never a problem until it starts dropping. And the more equities have been bought on margin, the more problematic that may be. Um, so here again, starting in 08, uh, right before the global financial crisis, we had 400 billion in margin, in margin debt. We had close to 1 trillion just recently, and that has fallen um, with equities recently and has also diverged from the Fed balance sheet. Itai, that margin debt, if a lot of it is being used to purchase uh, the greater market, wouldn't downward trends in that margin debt potentially be a downward pressure on the market that could keep pushing prices lower? Yeah, and that's exactly what we've seen. And obviously, the more margin debt was used, the more the more downward pressure you could have, right? Because if, if, if people bought equities on leverage, um, there could be forced selling and not voluntary selling. And that's really um, one of the biggest risks of what we've seen with margin. And margin that really exploded after the pandemic. Um, so that's definitely something to watch. What's interesting too, 46% um, of earnings results from 2010 could hypothetically be explained by the Fed balance sheet. So another trend to watch as the Fed balance sheet declines is whether or not it's going to have a negative impact on earnings. So that's, again, um, the market's out there to fend for itself. There is massive divergence between the policies of different central banks in the world. And that's something we haven't really seen in a while because you know, you have the Fed uh, raising rates and reducing the balance sheet so aggressively. But then you have other central banks like the ECB that are doing so a lot slower. But you also have Japan that is still using QE and is still printing money. So that's a completely different divergence uh, track. Uh, and Japan really finds itself in this difficult lose-lose situation. Japan is one of those countries that actually has yield curve controls. So the idea of a yield curve control is to control rates, not just in the short term, but also some of these longer duration, like 10 years and things like that, that have a bigger impact on mortgages and other, uh, other big markets. So that means a lot of government spending to basically suppress yields that should be higher, correct? Right. So if you have other rates in the world that are going a lot higher, especially in the United States, uh, and you know Japan sells a lot of stuff to the United States, it's a big exporter there. Um, China also is one, um, which we've also seen some moves in the in the yuan as well. But the idea here is that the interest rate in Japan wants to move up, especially Japan has massive amounts of debt, and it wants to move up naturally in response to these moves up around the world. But Japan has yield curve control policies. So what do they do? They print yen, and then they, they use the yen to buy those treasuries to keep them low. So what's the problem here? You keep the yield curve control in place, you're going to have to pre print a hell of a lot of yen in order to keep buying those bonds, which massively devalues the yen. You mm -hmm. drop the yield curve control, and you risk a national default, which could be a big, big problem for the world given Japan's debt load. Japan actually has more than 200% debt to GDP. It's, I believe, the most indebted developed nation in the world. And the yen has been declining very quickly. Uh, this is now one of the fastest declines in the value of the yen we've seen in recent years. It's as fast as they come. And a lot of it has to do with maintaining the yield curve control and the policy divergence between the Bank of Japan and uh, the Federal Reserve. It's also been extremely correlated with the increase in the 10-year treasury yield, um, which it's putting pressure on that. And you can see that the Bank of Japan is intervening to maintain that 0.25% line uh, came out. And that's really where we've stopped in recent days. So last week, 
the Bank of Japan had a policy meeting where uh, their president, Kuroda, decided, said that we're just going to continue to defend that yield curve situation. He said, um, we're basically going to do business every day and we're going to print as much yens as needed and we're going to defend the 0.25%. Of course, the second he says that, the yen devalues even more. Um, just one of the very interesting global inflection points to watch. There was a country just very recently that also had yield curve controls and realized that it's not worth keeping them and decided to let the yields float. Okay. Australia, Australia adopted yield curve control in response with the pandemic. Uh, you can see where it was. And right there, not that long ago in December, the Royal Bank of Australia ends yield curve control. I believe that was the biggest increase in their long dated yield in history in one day. Um, and look where they are today. Um, it's way up in um, you know, the 2% area after the end of yield curve control. So Australia obviously has a lot less debt than Japan. Imagine a scenario where Japan ends yield curve control. What could potentially happen to Japanese yields? I don't even want to speculate, but just as an example of one of the, one of the things that a free trade until it isn't. So Itai, let's talk about this. So Soros has bro broken the Bank of England. He's tried to break some other countries before. Is there a move where somebody could try to, to break the, the BOJ here? And if so, how would one go about doing it? I think this is actually the, uh, the widow maker trade, right? Because Japan had this big debt load. People have been speculating over Japanese defaults forever. I actually think now is one of the times that a scenario like that could happen when you have the policy divergence. It's still probably unlikely because they can print a lot of yen, but um, shorting Japanese government bonds uh, at a 0.25% yield, you know, the risk is that the yields go back to negative and you lose some value in the bonds. But if, J if Japan, for whatever reason, abandons the yield curve control, you could have an incredible uh, rising yield in a very short period of time, which could yield some really big profits. Okay. Um, this is one of the reasons I pay a lot of attention to cross asset volatility when it comes to things like currencies, uh, Japanese yen volatility, very elevated compared to where the VIX is still, uh, which makes sense given this, this situation. A lot of people are hedging yen risk, um, interest rate risk differentials, things like that. Actually, the cost of hedging the currency and investing in the United States are a break even. There's almost no uh, there's almost no gain to be made on that interest rate differential right now. Okay, the nine trillion dollar question: Where do we go from here? I'll give you a few options. Um, first off, it's important to notice that the Nasdaq recently has been correlated with the ten year yield invertedly. So whatever the 10 year yield was doing, the NASDAQ has been following it for quite some time. Correlations do break sometimes, but fundamentally it makes sense where um, multiples drop when interest rate increase. So we've seen also the NASDAQ VIX increase and the bond VIX increase even more. Again, cross asset volatility, important to watch. So the trillion dollar question, what if it is like 2000? I'm not saying that it is, but a bear market is always a possibility. And maybe we're in one already we wouldn't we wouldn't know if we're in one you know for another 6 to 12 months then it will be obvious in hindsight that we were in one so the 2000 uh, dot com collapse it's interesting right 30 days after minus 27% you're thinking buying the dip this is okay then it goes to 16% there's kind of kind of recovery but 630 days after the peak it's down 80% um it's almost unfathomable to, 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 to think about what actually happened during that time, but it's just something to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about risk, because these things will happen again at some point. We don't know obviously when or how, but it's one of those things to just think about. I also saw um, Bezos and Gurley tweeting about uh, the impacts on venture valuations and early stage companies on a go forward. And they were more or less saying, hey, everybody, who's built their model based on the valuations of the past, the second part of the past 13 years, they're in for a rude awakening. Like things are, things are gonna be, things are gonna be fundamentally changing. So for all of our people in, you know, in VC and that, in that type of world, like there's a, 
there's some uh, interesting things happening there. Well, because if you're repricing your valuation on the IPO, then you probably need a different price earlier in order to make that work, right? So that's that's one of the things that's driving that. Um, and let's compare 2022 to historical bear markets, if this is a bear market. And I'm not saying that it is, it could be. Um, but comparing 2022 to some of the bear markets in history, it's still in the very, very, very early stage. Um, a lot of them had a lot of snapback rallies that were very vicious, right? Like 5%, 10% snapback rallies. Compared this to 07 to 09, that was about a 50% drop that lasted a year and a half. Um, 73, 74, also 50% drop, but that lasted a lot longer because uh, there was a lot of rallies in between and it was just a brutal way down. 2000, 2003, very similar to that, lasted three years. Again, 50% decline. Uh, not comparing it to uh, you know 29, that's a lot worse, obviously, worse in history. 90% drop that took um, a good amount of time. And 37 to 42, I believe, the longest bear market in history. Just a very shallow, slow train wreck. Um, question, is it more like 73, 74? Interesting observation. Uh, during that time, we had stagflation. So stagflation is, again, contracting economic growth and high inflation. Potentially, one of the things you can um, compare this to, we just had a GDP print last week of negative 1.4%, which was a surprise. Um, and inflation is fairly high. If this does get into more recessionary type of environment, we have a few more declining um, GDP growth quarters. Uh, what's interesting is that during that time, the Fed, uh, the Fed funds rate was very well correlated with the performance of the stock market. So in this case, you're seeing the Fed fund rate inverted versus the stock market at the time. So if this is going to hold true for this period, what you will, what you will see is when, um, if the Fed continues to raise interest rates, will the market continue to fall to track it? Um, so that's definitely one of the things that I'm watching. So let's talk about the bull case. We talked about a lot of bearish things. What could go right? Um, we've seen a lot of outflows. Typically, when you're seeing a lot of outflows, um, that could be a sign of capitulation. Money is going to come back at some point. And liquidity is very, very poor. And um, this, is, this is a way to see kind of like the notional depth of S&P 500 futures on a go-forward basis. Liquidity is exceptionally poor. It's very close to what it was during March 2020. But it's important to realize liquidity works both ways. So it doesn't take a lot of buying right now if some of the money comes back to potentially push the price up a lot. Um, because poor liquidity, again, can, can just exaggerate moves in either direction. Sentiment is absolutely terrible. Um, if you look at the investor intelligence survey, it feels like almost everyone is bearish. And historically speaking, when everyone is bearish, it's so bad that it's good, right? Because at some point when people start going back into the market um, and the market goes up, all of these people that are outside are going to basically start coming back in, which could push the market a lot higher. That said, bad sentiment can stay bad for a long time during bear markets, just like good sentiment can stay bullish for a long time during a bull market, right? So it doesn't mean an immediate type of reversal. Um, CTA, uh, so commodity trade op, uh, funds and hedge fund positioning are relatively very low. They don't have a lot of exposure to equities at all. So again, same theme. If prices do reverse, that can trigger a lot of chasing because hedge funds are going to be left behind. Their performance is going to look bad. So they're going to have to add on a lot of long equity position to keep up with the markets. Otherwise, um, it will make their year numbers look pretty bad. Uh, again, very short-term indicator. Here you're seeing the S&P in blue and the put-call ratio in uh, green. So when that number is really elevated, there is a lot of put buying happening. So short-term, it moves the market lower. But um, what happens if some of these puts are closed, uh, what can happen is that it actually goes in the other direction. What you can see is when everybody is on one side of the boat, everybody owns puts, market could put in a short-term low happens again, happens again. It's actually kind of funny because when everybody owns calls, which is the other side, then the market can sometimes move in the other direction. So contrarian indicator, and we're seeing the put ratio extremely elevated um, in recent days. And I think one of the most interesting sources of buying is coming back online, buybacks. 
So during earnings, uh, companies are actually prohibited from buying back their own stock until they report. And for the majority of April, as you can see here between April 6th and April 20th, 70 through 90% of S&P companies were actually not allowed to buy their own stock. We know there's a trillion dollars worth of buybacks coming into the market this year. And in May, the blackout period is over and the buyback buyer is, is, coming, is coming back. 